Welcome back to Business Air TV. I'm Preston Holland. I'm here with Nate Millicum, the co-founder and CEO of EPS. Nate, thanks for coming on. Yeah, Preston, thanks for having me. So I want to explore this concept of energy storage and how that marries up with electric propulsion and what type of advances we can expect to see in the coming few years as electric propulsion becomes more viable as a fuel source. Yeah, well, it's a wonderful question, um, and it's it's not an easy answer, but what we would say is energy storage is really at the forefront, and it's the central enabling technology that makes electric propulsion actually happen. So there's a lot of different architectures that you can look at. Some people say, well, is it a hybrid architecture? Is it a SAF? Is it all electric? Like, what's really going to win? And our contention is, it's all of them, and it depends on what mission you're doing. So one of the unique things about being a leader in this space is we've worked on everything. We've worked on hybrid propulsion architectures. We're doing an all-electric powertrain that we're certifying right now. We've actually integrated with fuel cells. Um, at the end of the day, a battery or the storage device is a very interesting technology for particularly the power portions of the mission. So that's things like when you're climbing or if you're in a VTOL, you're hovering and you need just a lot of power, the battery can deliver that very efficiently. So being able to store it, to store it in a light, um, low cost, easy to operate, safe, device uh, is really paramount to this whole industry happening. So one of the criticisms of electric propulsion and of battery storage is that the rate, the, the ratio of weight to power output is so far from a SAF or from even hydrogen electric uh, that because and because that's a fixed weight. It doesn't actually get lighter as it uses the energy. It's a static weight. Um, so what are you guys doing to try and increase either, is it either is it capacity or weight or both? Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question. And so to kind of address the root of it is when people typically do those studies, they're powering, they're, they're comparing the raw energy storage of say a gallon of fuel to the equivalency in a battery. And when you actually do that comparison, fuel is a very robust storage device. Now what people don't realize is there's a lot that has to happen from that fuel being converted to actually energy and then actually distributed to where the prop is. So when you look at just the distribution efficiency of an all-electric powertrain, it's way more efficient. And so when you combine these different sources, um, and use them at different types of the mission, that's where you get an overall propulsion level architecture efficiency. And it also gives you better economics than what you would see just on today's uh, traditional combustion engines. So a data point I, I share in an all electric powertrain uh, in flight training, because that's one of the first areas where we see adoption, is flight training actually has the ability to be about 40% cheaper per flight hour than it is today. And when you think of the huge problem that solves, like we're, we're having a hard time just getting pilots to staff the fleets that we have today, let alone build huge fleets of eVTOLs or other advanced air mobility concepts. Attacking that problem and reducing the cost for people to become a certified pilot, that's a huge enabler for all these new platforms. Yeah, so basically what you're doing is you're increasing the fixed cost of acquisition right now because battery uh, powered aircraft. Uh, Andy Chen earlier today was talking about the difference in purchasing a gas powered versus an electric powered. You're looking at, I don't know, a 30% or so cost increase up front, but your variable cost per hour is so much lower. Uh, these flight schools are actually going to be able to run more efficient uh, businesses and increase their bottom line while still saving the end user money. Is that what you're saying? So there's a lot of ways to look at the value equation. So whether you spend the money up front, um, but to your point, I, I would agree, the reliability is significantly higher on an electric powertrain than in as a combustion engine. You have way less maintenance. So as a result of that, when you aggregate how long it lasts versus how much you spent, both on the initial procurement and the cost to maintain it, your aggregate cost per flight hour goes down by about 40%. Very interesting. 
Well, I think that that's a great way to s sustain. We're talking today about sustainable business aviation and sustainable aviation, not just from a fuel source, but also how do you sustain staffing? How do you sustain the long term, the long tail life of business aviation, general aviation as a whole? And so that definitely goes into that. I want to dive a little bit deeper onto the history of your company and start talking and talk about, um, you know, where did the idea come from? How did, why did you start, you know, take us back to the roots. When was it? You tell, tell us a little bit about it, because I think that you guys are a company that everybody uh, likely knows a product that uses your product, but doesn't necessarily know that you guys are the ones behind the product. Yeah, so that's a great question of how I got started and how the company got started. Um, my first exposure to lithium ion battery technology and aviation was back in the mid 2000s. I got a chance to work on one of the first lithium ion batteries to be certified for a commercial airplane, and it was on Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Uh, it was within the flight control electronics suite. And lithium really changed the game for more electric aircraft. Um, it, was, it was lighter, it was more power dense, um, it had less space claim that it took within the aircraft. It was, it was a compelling technology. Granted, we had a lot of certification and entry into service challenges with a number of those technologies, but Overall, you could see what a compelling role this had to play in the overall architecture. And then um, when I left Honeywell, I was, I was managing a uh, power portfolio for them, but I went to a power semiconductor company. And I just got called into the CEO's office like first week on the job and he said, hey, I bought a battery company and you know a lot about batteries, right? So your job is to make more money off of it, essentially. It and uh, that's how I met the other co-founder, Randy Dunn. And when I, I, I looked at what Randy was doing, everything that was on my product roadmap, everything that I dreamed, which, that I wish was working in aviation, it was already there and right in front of me. So we incubated a team. We built it there for six years. Um, we got to do a lot of cool stuff with the military. And then as fate would have it in 2016, we got a chance to spin out this group that we had built and take it private. And that's how Electric Power Systems uh, was formed. So I had, I had no aspirations to be an entrepreneur or do something like this. Uh, in, in fact, when I had studied entrepreneurship in my undergrad degree, it sounded like a scary road, but um, this was just, it was a no brainer. We, we had compelling technology. We had an incredible team that we had built. We had a customer base that we needed to, to uh, service. And then we got a very unique opportunity right when we spun out from NASA. Um, NASA was doing an X-plane where they wanted to prove out distributed electric propulsion and there was a lot of very innovative companies on there that we were all small. Joby was one of the companies that was on that platform as well. And uh, we really incubated the technology there and matured it and then things just kind of took off from there and we, we emerged as the leader. We've designed over uh, 50 unique systems that we've qualified, uh, whether to NASA standards, the FAA standards, or the, the military standards. We've designed over 500 architectures. We've got eight aircraft flying. That number will go to 14, and we'll be the first to certify a propulsion battery uh, early next or next year, in the middle of next year. So, we are definitely leading in this space, and we're now starting to look to how we scale. Yeah, absolutely. So, on that question of scale. Um, and you said that you had the opportunity to take, it was a carve out that you took the company private, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So talk to us about raising capital in order to take that private, right? You clearly are the key person or one of the key team um, that was in that group uh, in order to carve it out from the semiconductor company. Uh, but how, do, how does that process work? Who do you go ask for money and uh, what, what are they expecting in return? What is, what's their time horizon like? What, what was that process like for you and your partners? Yeah, so that's a great question. I always like in raising capital to uh, surfing. If you've ever surfed, when you got a wave, you, you have to look it, scout it out, be ready for it, and then when you catch it, ride it, essentially. And um, one of the things that we saw, and, and it was a uh, not a traditional source of funding was there was a lot of funded research that was out there, whether it was through NASA, whether it was through Sibbers, whether it was through uh, R&D, everybody was looking at the technology. And we were really able to do pre-seed and series A with just government grants and external funding source because we had the know-how and we had the team already. And that proved to be extremely useful to when we had to take in larger amounts of capital to start to scale. In that situation with your pre-seed and your Series A, which is government funded or 
is that is the government now on your cap table, or how does that how does that work from a capital structure? No, one of the great things about um, our government and the Small Business Innovation Research Grant is it's really that it's designed to give technology companies kind of that pre-seed. You uh, get to own the intellectual property, and the government doesn't take any ownership on your cap table. So, really good deal. But why it's it's actually a good deal for subsequent investors is they want proof points to see is the technology of interest to anyone. So in this case, the military may look at it and say, that's a really unique technology. I'll fund low technology readiness level development. And if it matures, then we'll actually use it because we have a, a market or a use case for it. So these grants help you find product market fit, which the product market fit portion essentially is what venture capitalists are betting on that you'll be able to find product market fit. The government grant takes that out so you already can establish commercial viability and you can go raise a Series A with that without having taken on significant capital dilution? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so when we got later on into the fundraising process, um, I, I'd like to say we were incredibly insightful, but really what happened to us is um, we were selling a lot of product to the Boeing company and we were on most of their projects and we kind of jointly realized and say, wow, we're doing a lot of custom batteries for you guys. Um, could we actually think up a concept that is more common, more modular, and can work for all the platforms that Boeing may want to electrify in the future? And that's actually, we got uh, connected Horizon X. We then went through a due diligence process and in our view, they were a fantastic partner. They had a lot of things that they provided outside of just uh, capital. Um, support, um, coaching, um, a lot of advisement, a lot of pathways into their business. And that really has helped incubate and bring in other, other investors, uh, such as Saffron was brought along. Uh, JetBlue has been a fantastic partner that we're working with. And um, really that guidance from Strategics has enabled us to, to refine the product, bring it to market, um, but then also give us a market when it's ready. We actually anticipate that a lot of those customers will be some of our initial launch customers. Yeah, absolutely. I, so when you take on that type of investment and you're thinking about hitting a scale inflection point, um, you had mentioned that the grants had gotten you to product market fit, you had some sort of commercial viability, but when you take in that level of capital, and frankly, I am unaware of how much you raised, and that may or may not be public information, but you take in this large amount of capital, you're looking to scale a manufacturing organization, which is a capital intensive uh, prog prog project or progress, cut that, capital intensive portion of the business. Um, what, what did you start attacking first? What did you say, I've pinpointed this part of the business that needs this capital infusion right now for us to be able to hit that scale inflection point of commercial viability? Oh, that's a great question. So how did we, or what did we select first um, in terms of where to infuse capital? It was, it was, there was a number of projects we already had going and there was a number of ideas that we were incubating. And the nice thing about doing it that way is they kind of grow and mature to a point where you say, I can see customers over there that want that. Um, that needs to go faster. That has a large market opportunity. And the project's mature enough, the technology's mature enough, you say, well, if I were to just allocate capital there and put a dedicated team and dedicated focus, then I can see exactly what the return will be on that. And that makes it a lot simpler in allocating capital. Um, you go in, in some way of what screams the loudest or what has the highest needs, uh, if you will. The squeakiest wheel gets the grease, as they say. Exactly. Although I don't know how much grease you actually use in electric propulsion, so that might not be a good reference for It's your not a company. greasy process in electrification. <laughs> well, that's really great. Well, thank you so much for coming on and, and giving us a little bit more insight. Um, where can people follow your story? Where can people keep up with you, um, either personally, professionally, or, or with your company? Uh, absolutely, epsenergy.com is, is our website. We've got uh, Twitter accounts, we've got Instagram accounts, and um, we do quite a bit on social media. So uh, yeah, continue to follow us, and um, we, we'd love to bring people along with the journey. Awesome, very, very cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it, and I'm, uh, I'm sure we'll see you around. Thanks for having me. Preston. Awesome. Thanks.